So all together I've done over 27 years of my life <clears throat> locked up. I started doing time at the age of 10. Uh, kept on going in and out of the system. Uh, been a junior hall gang of times. I, I've been to three group homes. Uh, I did two terms in juvenile camp. I did four years in the California Youth Authority. And then I went to prison on my first term in the state. I did seven years my first term. And then I got out and went back to prison again, to state prison. And I did 14 years on my second term. So all together, I did over 27 years of my life locked up. Nothing that I'm proud of, nothing to brag about. I wish if I could go back and do it all over again, I would have went the square bear route, would have pursued my education, would have started stacking my bread when I was hella young, would have learned everything that normal civilians and people learn, you know, feel me, growing up. Like getting a driver's license, getting a job, paying bills, being responsible, you feel me, socializing, experiencing stuff like that. Instead of getting out, you know what I'm saying, when I'm 39 years old with basically spending more than a third of my life in locked up, incarcerated, and not really knowing much, you feel me, not knowing how to get a driver's license, fucking go f take a permit test, freaking pay bills, get your phone hooked up credit cards, debit cards, all taxes, all that stuff that civilians do. I barely started learning how to do that when I was 39 years old. I never had a real legit job until I was 39 years old. My whole life I was hustling, gang banging, you know what I'm saying? Pulling licks, slanging dope, robbing, sticking a gun in people's face, getting money the easy way, the fast way, never worked for it. You know what I'm saying? Legitimate, never worked a legitimate job my whole life. But yeah, this video, I just wanted to tap in and uh, share like out of all the times that I've done, out of all the places that I've been, believe it or not, the hardest time that I ever did out of all my 27 years was the four years that I did in the California Youth Authority. Now, some of y'all might not know about the California Youth Authority, CYA, YA for short, or the Y, but it's a juvenile prison out here in California where they send juveniles who basically are the worst of the worst, who are sentenced as juvenile lifers, sentenced as adult. Um, a lot of them are waiting to go to prison, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you could be in the California Youth Authority from age of eight to 10, all the way up to 25 years old, you feel me? And so it was a different dynamic, you know what I mean? It was the worst of the worst for the juveniles. It was like the last place they'll send you before they send you to state prison. I went to the California Youth Authority when I was 13. I did four years there. I got out when I was 17. And when I was there, man, there's, there's institutions throughout the state of California um, riddled up and down from Southern California all the way up north. There's Nellis, OH Close, Paso Robles. Uh, uh, what's the one up north? Preston, Carl Holton, Ventura. There's a lot of different institutions, you feel me? And each of them, uh, YTS, and each of them are rocking and rolling in their own separate ways, you feel me? I did all my time at Nellis, which is like one of the most worst California Youth Authority institutions besides YTS. It'd be like YTS and Nellis, they up there and then the other ones are underneath them, right? The other ones are still cracking, Preston is cracking, you know what I mean? But YTS and Nellis, man, if you were to ask me, they did worse, you know what I'm saying, out of all the institutions. And in the 2000s, the early 2000s, they ended up shutting down the California Youth Authority because of all the corruption that's going on in there, staff assaults, the staff assaulting inmates, inmates committing suicide, inmates getting raped, you know what I'm saying? All, all this stuff that was people getting stabbed, sliced, beat up, punked, all kind of crazy stuff going on in there, right? And a lot of kids was complaining to their parents, a lot of kids, you know what I'm saying, was killing themselves and 
you know, parents filing lawsuits and stuff like that. But, you know, me, for the most part, nothing was happening. Like, it was just all being swept under the rug. People were turning a blind eye to it. But then it came to a point where it couldn't be ignored no more. And so they started investigating. And as a result of the investigation, they came to see that the California Youth Authority was corrupt. It was out of hand. The police, the staff in there couldn't control the inmates. And so they shut down the institutions. That's like unheard of, you know what I'm saying? But that's how rocking and rolling it was. That's almost saying like California state prisons are so violent or so fucking crazy that the feds stepped in and shut down all the prisons of California. But they didn't do that in the state of Cal California state prisons. They did that to the juvenile state California Youth Authority prison. And that's how cracking it was. But anyways, uh, when I was in the California Youth Authority, agents were a minority on the, on the main line. There wasn't a lot of us out of the institution of, I don't know, say for instance, 2,000 people. There are probably less than 50 agents, less than 30 agents on the whole line. You know what I'm saying? So sprinkled throughout the institution and the list, there was probably like 15, I believe like 15 buildings. I'm, I'm just taking a guesstimate right now. I don't want to sit here and try to count them up in my head, but there had to be like 15 buildings right a minimum and out of sprinkled throughout the institution like each building that had like three to five agents you know what i'm saying f that you feel me so we had it hard as it was There was a lot of gang bang going on a lot of youngsters that were turned up you know what I'm saying ya was like a a, a a training ground for the prison and so a lot of cats in ya they were trying to like you know what i'm saying uh function and, and program according to prison rules and a lot of them didn't know prison rules, so they would make up rules thinking that that's how it would be in prison. And I, at the same time, there were cats in Y who caught cases, you know what I mean? They would catch stabbings or whatever, go to prison, state adult prison, do their little time in adult prison, and then return to YA to finish their YA time. So when these cats would come back from prison, they would come back with, you know what I mean, a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of prison game, a little bit of prison politics and information and they would try to push that on to the rest of the institution mainly like south siders bloods crips or whatever right but the main ones i was trying to push these hard lines was the south siders right and so when i was there this is the early 90s um and at the time uh the mexican mafia had put a green light on the on the trgs the tiny rascal gang right so the south siders they had this rule where they said that anybody that helps a TRG while he's getting beat on or jumped or stabbed or whatever. Anybody jumps in to help a TRG will automatically be green lighted. Now, this rule applied at Nellis. It might apply to other institutions, the California Youth Authority, because each institution varies. They go by their own rules. It's, that's how like crazy it is. Like, you know what I'm saying? One institution, that might not be a rule, but the institution I was at, that was a rule. So they had this rule. So I come through, I'm 13 years old. I'm young, I'm churned up, I'm banged out. You know what I'm saying? I'm in the prime of my gangbang career. You know what I mean? I done went juvenile homes, three group homes. I done went to, I did two stints in juvenile camp. The next step up was the California Youth Authority. And after that, state prison. So I'm climbing up the ranks, you feel me? And I'm proud to be in the California Youth Authority. I'm proud that, you know what I'm saying? I could get that stripe under my belt and hit the streets and tell the homies like, yeah, I've been to why I survived that. I've been through that. See, because like the more places that you go where you have more chances of becoming a victim and you surviving, the more stripes you get. I mean, you're like a soldier. You made it through war, like one war after another, constantly getting deployed to different wars and institutions and you survive them, you make them out, make it back out. Then you get more stripes, you get more respect in the hood. And I was about that, you know what I'm saying? Building up my rep building up my name, becoming someone that was known, putting my hood up on the map. You know what I'm saying? That's what I was all about. I just lived, breathed, ate shit, slept, woke up, went to sleep and woke up again. Gangsterism. You know what I'm saying? All about my hood. So when I come through, you know what I'm saying? The homies is telling me like, yeah, they got this rule, right? Anybody try to help a TRG, you automatically gonna get green lighted. And so the Asian homies, they like in the building whispering to me like, so if a TRG homie comes, and he get jumped on, don't help him. You know what I mean? Like, stay out of it. And I'm looking at these cats like, y'all some bitch ass niggas, right? Like, y'all some sucker ass shit, right? Like, my whole thing was like, bruh, anybody that's my people, I don't give a fuck if they, they, we enemies on the streets or not or whatever. If I see them getting jumped on, they're Asian, they're getting jumped on, I'm jumping in, I'm helping them regardless. You know what I'm saying? I'd be damned if I sit back 
and allow another race to jump on my people and not do nothing. Like, win, lose, or draw. You know what I'm saying? We going. You know what I'm saying? And I told the Asian homies, like, I don't care what y'all do. Fuck y'all. Y'all y'all on some bitch shit. Like, y'all ain't with it. That's y'all bad. But, you know what I'm saying? If a TRG homie rolls up, comes through, get jumped on, I'm going to back his play. Fuck it. So, you know, the, 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 the decision to do that was a big decision because, you know, for those who don't understand, like, by me helping somebody that's from TRG, I would get green-lighted. And being green-lighted means I'm going to get jumped on by every single Southern Hispanic in the institution. Not just in my building, but the whole entire institution. I go to child, I go to school, I go to the library, I go anywhere. I'm getting jumped on. They're sending missiles, two, three, four, five missiles at a time, jumping me. Or in the building, same thing, constantly fighting. You know what I'm saying? And it's like you against hundreds of dudes, you know what I'm saying? And for some, that might be a big thing to bite, thing to chew on, but for me, it was like, I knew what I was getting myself into, and I was willing, you know what I'm saying? I was like, it is what it is, I'm gonna die for this shit if I die, you know? And so, after the homies tell me about this, you know what I mean? Just shortly after they tell me that that was the rule, a TRG homie ended up rolling up, he ended up coming through, came off the bus, right? He came off of, uh, the fish tank, Truman. So when you come through, when you come through Nellis, you gotta hit, the orientation building, which we call the fish tank, they call it the Truman. All the all the uh, cottages and institutions, that's what they call the building, cottages, they all named after presidents. There's uh, Kennedy, Madison, Hayes, Jackson, Washington, you know what I'm saying, Tyler, and the fish tank was called Truman. So, a homie from TRG came through, he came hit the building. Now, I'm not going to say names and shit like that, because, you know, that's my old life. Like, I try my best to keep I tell these stories, but I try my best to keep like the people who are part of the story uh, anonymous because I, they, I don't know if they want their story to be told. You feel me? But yeah, homie came through. He was from San Bernardino, TRG, and he was with it. You know what I mean? Off top. The Asian homies that was already there, there was about three three of them plus me, like four. So the homie come through, make us five. They getting at him like, hey, bro, check this out. We know you from TRG, this and that, but don't openly claim it because... The south side, they're going to jump on you off top. You're going to be green-lighted. You know what I'm saying? Whoa, whoa, whoa. And I'm listening to the shit, and I'm kind of like observing what the TRG homie's going to say. Because if he on some suck shit like, okay, uh, on some scary fucking bitch-ass shit like, okay, uh, I'm not going to be claiming my shit openly so these motherfuckers don't jump on me, then I'm I'm, I'm not going to even fuck with him. I'm going to be good on him, right? Like, man, fuck you too, right? You on some bitch shit, right? Probably fucking around, go against the whole car, just me against all the Asians type shit, right? I was like already leaning towards that. So I'm sitting back listening to the Asian homies get at the TRG homie as far as like, you know, me and you from TRG, the South Siders find out, they're gonna jump on you, you're gonna have to get them up with hundreds, hundreds, almost thousands of motherfuckers in the institution. You know what I'm saying? You know, if you choose to fucking claim TRG openly, that's what's gonna happen, what you finna do, right? The Asian homies is advising him not to. And I'm listening and the TRG homie, he about it. He's like, man, fuck that. This TRG, this tiny rascal gang, I don't give a fuck. You know what I'm saying? Like, these motherfuckers hit me up, ask me where I'm from. Let them know it's TR, right? So, of course, as a new agent that just came, the, the Southern Hispanics is on his bumper. They automatically, like, like sharks in the water. You know what I'm saying? They want to know where he's from. They're checking him out. They're looking at him. And so I'm, I'm telling him. I let him know, like, hey, homie, it's going to be it's gonna be a hard road. We're going to go through some shit, but I'm going to back your play. You know what I'm saying? So once these motherfuckers hit you up, ask you where you from, let them know where you from, and let's get it. You know what I'm saying? And he's like, that's what's up, man. I appreciate you. So out of all of us, it was just me and him. And so we was down in the dorm, and some, some Southsiders hit him up. Hey, where you from? The homie jumped off his, off the top bunk like this TRG gang. And I'm right there on the bottom bunk, just like a couple bunks down, sitting up, just waiting. Like waiting for them to jump on him, right? So boom, two of them rushed him. They rush in and jump on them, boom, I jump in. So it was a two on two. Next thing you know, like five, six more south side jump in. So we getting jumped. Like there's like four motherfuckers jumping me. There's like four or five motherfuckers jumping him. But we getting it in, you know what I'm saying? We just chunking them, like falling, slipping. The uh, the dorm was like cement ground. Like it was smooth though. Almost like a gymnasium. Like we kept on slipping, falling, jumping, getting back up. But you know what I mean? We were outnumbered. And the whole time, we just getting it in, the police yelling, like, get down, get down. They, they over there spraying mace and all that shit. But, you know, when you get jumped, you don't feel no pain. I mean, you feel it, but you're, you're, the adrenaline is pumping so hard that 
You know what I mean? You just in beast mode. You just survivor mode. You just going. You know what I'm saying? And so, and so are the south siders. So are the, so are the dudes jumping you. So even though we getting maced, even though we getting fucked up, we're not stopping. We just get keep on going. You know what I'm saying? And so and we just rocking and rolling. We fucking. I'm trying to look for the homie, but I'm so busy getting fucked up myself that I can't even help him. I'm knowing that he ain't coming to help me because he getting jumped on it. Where the fuck he at? But I just know he's somewhere near me. You know what I mean? And it's hard to get back up after they drop you on the ground. They stomping you out. Every time you try to get back up, they just stomping you. You know what I'm saying? Young motherfuckers, they hella like... You know what I'm saying? It ain't like the old motherfuckers that got back problems. You old, you don't kick the same like you used to. You ain't no young whippersnapper. You know what I'm saying? But in YA, all these young motherfuckers, they athletic. They strong. They full of adrenaline. And so when they kick and they punch, they really kicking and they really punching. They really fucking some shit up, right? And so every time there's an alarm... The staff, they hit an alarm, and they're in the institution. There's like a GMC van, and they full of like uh, the security squad or the goon squad. And all they do is just post up. And whenever there's an alarm, that van full of cops will roll up to the building and jump out and run up in the building to stop whatever the incident may be. Maybe a riot, it may be a one on one, a two on one, or a jumping that, that like me and the homie was going through. And so finally, the, the goon squad comes running up in there, and they come, and, and, and they have enough people to fucking break everything up, you know what I'm saying? So me and the homie, and the dudes that jumped on us, we all get handcuffed, and we go to the hole. And then when we go to the hole, uh, the, the south siders in the hole, they talking shit, they telling us, oh, y'all green lighted, fuck y'all, they disrespecting our dead homies, disrespecting our hood. They keeping us on sleep restriction, banging on the wall all day. They have one dude banging on our wall all day. And then that dude that bangs all day, he'll, 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 he'll change shifts. Like, he'll stop and someone else will fucking take up the next four hours. Banging on a bunk locker all day. And then he'll, he'll stop and another motherfucking south side will get to banging. And so, 24 hours, it's just constant noise. You know what I'm saying? Fools banging on their... You know, you and your cell, they banging on the wall. You laying on your bunk, they bunk, they banging on a bunk. They banging on the desk in their cell. It goes right to the wall. Bang, bang, bang. You, you, you can't sleep, bro. You just like being sleep deprived. You're going through it. You know what I'm saying? And so, and, and as they're doing that, they're constantly talking shit. They're constantly making threats. They're constantly trying to get in your head. We're going to fuck you up, chink. We're going to fuck you up, nip. We're going to kill your ass when you get out. You fucking green lighted. Fuck your hood, motherfucker. We're going to. We're going to jump on your ass. We're going to stab you. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. You know what I mean? And like I said, I was a young, turned up motherfucker. I didn't give a fuck about none of that. You know what I mean? I'm just like, fuck y'all. It's good. It's on site. When I come up out this motherfucker, when you see me, handle your business. But the homie from TRG, I guess over time, the sleep deprivation, being in the hole, being harassed, constantly being threatened. Understanding the situation that he was in, being green lighted, knowing that that when you come out the hole, you can have a couple hundred up to a thousand motherfuckers ready to jump on you on site. It, it got to him, I believe, and he he never came out the hole. He just refused to come back out. You know what I'm saying? And so in the end, I was mad because I was like, "Damn, I helped this motherfucker. He was about to get jumped. I helped his ass." And <laughs> I got put on green light for helping them. And now when we're able to get out this hole and go back to the yard and get cracking again, instead of coming out here with me, so it'd be two of us against the whole fucking institution, it's just me now. You know what I'm saying? But as a gangster, I was like, this is just part of life. This is how the dice roll sometimes. Motherfucker, you can't control what other people do. You can't control what you do. And you chose to keep it G. He chose not to. Fuck it, life goes on. Now, like, that's in the past. Deal with what's in front of you. And what's in front of you, you got a gang of motherfucking Southsiders who want to kill you. You know what I'm saying? Survive. Do what you got to do. So when I went to the California Youth Authority, I had uh, 18 months to do. And uh, instead of doing 18 months, I ended up doing, I ended up maxing out. I ended up doing fucking four years. You feel me? All because... I kept on fighting, and in, in California Youth Authority, when you fight, they tack on time. They'll give you like three months, and then you keep on fighting, they'll give you six months. And the thing about the California Youth Authority is like when you catch time, you can't get it back. There's no such thing as earning your time back in there. Doing good, good behavior, don't give you your time back. Like in prison, state, adult prison, 
you catch write up. There's some write ups depending on the division, like how 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 severe the write up is. You could get some time back for doing good. You know what I'm saying? You might catch 90 days lost for, I don't know, being out of bounds or some. That's like a petty write up, right? You stay clean for fucking 45 days and you would get about 60 of that time back. You know what I mean? So, but in YA, nah, once you catch six months, that's six months of your life. You know what I'm saying? You ain't getting none of that back. So I quickly maxed out. I just kept on getting jumped on. Every time I got jumped on, every time I got in a fight, I got more time. And before I knew I was maxed out. So I had nothing to lose anyways. So I'll get jumped on, go right back to the hole, come out, fight, get jumped on again, go right back to the hole, come out, get jumped on, go right back to the hole. But the good thing about being on green light is like in there in, in, in Nellis when I was there, they had the Southsiders had groups of people on green light. They had Nathaniels on green light. They had do some MS on green light. For for a time they had 18th Street, full 18th Street on green light, full some Montevilla on green light. And Asians like me who who disrespected them, who helped TRGs, whatever, got put on green light. And then they had dudes, random dudes like Bloods, Crips, white boys, whatever, who just happened to dis, dis, disrespect the Sioux, the Serranos, right, who got put on green light. And so, say for instance, right now we what, we in July. They'll say for all of this month of July, they just focusing on the Nathaniels that are, are green lighted. So everyone else that's green lighted, might be uh, MS, 18th Street, me, or whatever, for that month, we could kick it. You know what I'm saying? They're not focusing on us. They're just focusing on the Nathaniels. And then come August, it might be all Asians that they're going to get that month. Or it might be a mix. Asians, black green lighters, white green lighters, ex south side of green lighters, shit like that. You know what I mean? And then the month of September, they'll get all fucking MS green lighters and just leave the rest of us that are green lighted alone for that month and just focus solely on MS for that month. So there was times when I went a month, two months, whatever, without having to go through some shit, without having to fight, where I had to get jumped on. I was able to chill, get my visits, get my canteen, enjoy a little bit of yard, be out outside, you know what I mean, in the institution, whatever. But then when my month came, when I was, you know what I mean, they're focusing on me, boom, I'm getting jumped on and I'm going right back to the hole. You know what I mean? And that went on the whole time. But what I ended up doing was I went in there when I was 13. I went through puberty when I was in YA. I started working out when I was in there. I started training myself because I was in survivor mode. You know what I'm saying? And you, you don't understand, like, the strength you have until you're tested. You don't know how strong you are until you have no choice to be strong. And then when you're in a mindset where it's, like, all about survival and you got to survive... You start doing what you got to do to survive. I started working out hard. I started making weapons. I started working out two times a day, sometimes three times a day, eating all the right food, constantly just doing anything that could do anything to help me. I started practicing fighting. I started learning how to fight. I started training, learning jiu-jitsu, grappling, karate, kung fu. I started stretching. I started doing crazy shit. But all I was was becoming a soldier. I was building myself to become a killer. And just training myself to protect myself at all costs. So as I started training, as I started getting stronger, I started hurting motherfuckers. Now they trying to jump me and I'm knocking motherfuckers out. I started, started training, started getting better with my hands and, and fighting and shit. And now they're sending motherfuckers on me and I'm serving these cats. And then what, ha what ended up happening was, instead of me waiting for them to come jump on me, I would start attacking them. I would start getting off on them. I became a threat to them. In a sense that I'm no longer going to be a victim waiting for y'all to come jump on me. Waiting for y'all to snake me, dolphin me. You know what I'm saying? Hit me while I'm not looking. Nah, now I'm going to become a threat and get you when you ain't looking. Get you when you ain't prepared. Fuck you all. You know what I'm saying? Get the upper hand. Attack you when you're not expecting me to attack you. And so when I did that, it changed the whole dynamics of everything. They're like, damn. This fool went from low key like being a victim, a green lighted, a, a dude that's green lighted just waiting for us to get... For us to jump on him, you know what I'm saying? Now he's attacking us. And they didn't know how to deal with that shit. And so, the way they tried to deal with it was by becoming cool with me. Telling me, hey, you know what? You've been green lighted for years. You know what I'm saying? We get at the big homie who's running the institution or running the yard and get you off green light. And so, I told them fools like, of course I want to get off green light because why well, stay on that shit? If I could get off that shit, then I could get my business. I could go... To I could be in the yard. I don't have to be in the hole all day. I get my canteen. I could fucking go to school. You know what I mean? Instead of sitting in the hole all day. And I've been green lighted for years. You feel me? And so 
them dudes like, all right, they're going to get after big homie. And she was up, right? And so they did. And the big homie sent word to, to my building, to my cottage, and said, basically on a kite, he told the dude that had my, my building, he said, to get to, in order for that dude to get off green light, he got to get down one on one with all of the South Siders in your building. But he could choose one person to ride with him. So basically, it'd be two of us, me and someone else, getting down one on one with every every single Southern Hispanic in our building. And so, you know, I'm an ex Crip from an Asian gang, though, ex Asian Crip, right? And, uh, when I was in YA, I was real close with the Black Crips. I was basically running with the Blacks, you know what I'm saying? Because I was Cripping. And so I had a meeting with the Crips. And in YA, we had our own real prison gang. Own uh, Crip prison gang called Strictly Crips. And I was I was the only Asian that was a part of the Strictly Crips. And so I had a meeting with the homies. And this time we had just started the Strictly Crips. They were just coming up. But, uh. I had a meeting with the homies and I told them like what was happening, what was going on. And uh, I just needed one person to ride with me. You know what I'm saying? And uh, and uh, and after I get down with all the Southsiders one-on-one, I get off green light and you know what I mean? That'd be it. So uh, at the meeting, I asked the homies like, is there any of y'all willing to volunteer? So we all standing in a circle, right? Out in the yard. And I was like, if you're willing to ride with me, step into the middle of the circle and I'll pick. You know what I'm saying? If there's more than one person, I'll pick out of the group. So when I said that, all the Crips stepped in. Like, they were all willing to ride. Like, they were like, pick me, pick me, because I'll roll, I roll with you, I'll rock with you. Like, cause I got you. Woo, woo. So, me, being the smart motherfucker that I am, I picked the biggest, strongest Crip that I could. You feel me? You know what I'm saying? And the homie, he, yeah, like I said, you could be in Y till you're 25 years old. And the homie, like 24, right? From Compton. He was the South Side. He was the South Side Compton Crip. Big homie. He looked like, uh, um, I'm not going to say his name, but he looked like Frankenstein. I swear to God. This dude had veins coming down his forehead. He had a big ass box head like Frankenstein. He had green eyes and big ass jaw. Like he just looked like Frankenstein. So strong motherfucker, right? So basically in Hawaii, they got this thing called a blind or boxing ring or whatever, right? And the blind is basically a, a place where you go fight where the staff let you. You know what I'm saying? Like, like they set it up. You know what I'm saying? They're like, go ahead, go over there. We're going to be over here in the office and y'all go over there to the laundry room and fight one-on-one. -on -one. Or y'all go to the day room and fight one-on-one. -on -one. Or we're going to be over here watching TV and y'all go down to the dorm and fight. You know what I mean? And we're going to act like we didn't see nothing. We can't watch the whole building. There's only two, two or three staff inside the whole building so they're basically like playing dumb like oh we couldn't watch the shower area because we were over here watching the day room so they're fighting over there we didn't know you know what i mean type of shit so we had a gang of crooked counselors and crooked co's in our building and <clears throat> we basically got out the um and a lot of them were gang members we had a a a a, a co from rolling 60 cribs we had one from west side Pirate. we had two from west side power Rule, one from inglewood family bloods we had one from White Fence, a, 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 a dude that was from White Fence. We also had a female that was from White Fence. So we had a gang of staff that were gang members, you feel me? And they just had a job, so they was with it. They didn't give a fuck. So basically, long story short, I ended up like getting at the, like, look, this is the situation. Could I, could I set up a boxing ring in the day room and get down with all these fools? And there was probably like 75, 80 Southsiders, right? And then the staff was cool. They're like, go ahead, handle that shit, you know what I'm saying? So we went into the day room, we moved all the day room chairs out the day room, pushed them out to the yard, and basically all the Southsiders came up to the day room, and they were all on one side of the day room, and me and the homie from Southside Compton Crip, we were on the other side, and I just basically stepped into the middle of the day room, which is the ring, threw my hands up, like, what's happening? And they sent the first fool in, it was a little youngster. And like I said, by that time, I was strong, I've been working out, I'm skilled in fighting, I knocked his ass out. First hit, I'm knocking him out. I gave him like a two hit, two punch, I swung with my left and knocked him out with my right, all right? Boom, dropped them off top. And they're like, damn. But they weren't stupid though. So after I knocked them out, I, I stepped back. The homie from Compton Crip, he stepped up. They sent the motherfucker after him. The homie getting get, get him up with that food. He mixing them up or whatever, right? See, but what they did was, what the Southsiders did was they sent all their homies in the beginning, like a gang of little dudes to fucking tire us out, right? So after they tire us out, they sent the big dudes. You feel me? So... Like in the beginning, I'm probably finding like, and you gotta understand there's 70, 70, 80 of these motherfuckers. So um, 
I'm looking at finding over 30, 30 people by myself, right? So in the beginning, they, the first 15 is all little young motherfuckers just going in there to tire me out. Wrestle, grab me, do a little punching, whatever the fuck they do, right? And then the last, the last wave of them, the last fucking 20 or whatever, were all big, healthy youngsters, teenagers, adults, whatever. And by then I'm tired. You feel me? By the time I get to find them, I'm tired. And by the time I get to find the last dude, the last dude was an old Mexican. Uh, it was a he was a bulldog with the bulldogs around the south side in there. This motherfucker was a grown ass man. I'm like 16, 17 years old. This motherfucker 25 years old. You feel me? And all he did, he hitting hard. He mixing me up, right? And I'm so tired at the time, I couldn't even fight back. I just take the hits and ball up and just defend myself. But I got through that shit. And the homie from uh, Compton Crip, Southside Compton Crip, he got through it with me, you feel me? And that's how I ended up getting off the green light when I was in the California Youth Authority. And then not too long after that, I ended up paroling. But out of all the time that i done, like I said, i done over 27 and a half years. Those four years were the worst four years of my whole time locked up and i can honestly say that it did something to me the, those years that time that term it did something to me like it really fucked my head up it really fucked me up as a person and that's right when i got out like my second week out i was a suspect in a murder like i was just a hothead i didn't give a fuck about nothing um i got out worse than i went in you feel me and I try to tell people, my family members, homies, people that I fucked with, how the California Youth Authority was. And a lot of people didn't really, like, either believe me or they, they just didn't really, like, think it was that bad. You feel me? Until years later when the California Youth Authority was shut down, they had, like, that shit was all in the news and in the newspapers. And one of my sisters had sent me a, a clipping of a newspaper about them cutting, shutting down the California Youth Authority. And she apologized to me saying, like, she remembers me telling her, but she just didn't believe me until the fucking newspaper proved it. You know what I mean? And they, they had to shut down the California Youth Authority and so many institutions and yada, yada, yada. That it was then brought to the light and people kind of came to understand like, damn, this fool really went through some shit. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, that's my story. I hope y'all enjoyed it. And uh, continue tapping in, like, subscribe for more, and I thank y'all.